Hi, and welcome back to this week's GMBN Tech Show. Coming up on this week's show, uh, there's a new tyre from Bontrager, an enduro tyre, pretty good by all accounts. Uh, some Vibracore wheels, we have a look at something very cool from Spank Industries, and we have probably one of the best top mods entries we've ever seen. I think it's absolutely amazing. Okay, so let's dive into this week's show. Um, you're gonna have to excuse my eyes. I'm in a right old state with hay fever. I've just been unbearable today. So let's get on the topic. Speed versus comfort. Now this is something that's just come up casually in conversation amongst people. And it's kind of been a bit of a topic uh, from the EWS one and two out of Valde Fassa we've just come back from. Because a lot of the pro racers, obviously are setting up their bikes to be as fast as possible, but to be as fast as possible on those huge enduro stages, they actually have to sort of um, not make the bikes feel so race-like, essentially. So Isabel Cordura is running carbon bars for comfort uh, to help uh, resist some of the vibration coming through to the hands, although she did say that she switches between carbon and alloy depending on the course and the feel that she wants, uh, which suggests that her carbon bars might have actually had quite a bit more flex than alloy ones. She was also saying that she didn't use um, lock-on grips, she's using like push-on style grips, so two factors, A, smaller hands, but B, for the same size diameter grip, you technically get more rubber, so less vibration through to your hands. So uh, again, it's more comfort-based, but what I want to know is, do you set your bikes up uh, to be faster, or do you set them up to be more comfy? Uh, I guess you could have some of those traits crossing over, but I'm just curious to find out. So let's start with wheels. Now obviously you get carbon wheels and you get alloy wheels. Now forgetting the budget here, if you are running carbon wheels for example, what ride qualities do you get from yours? Uh, you can get some immensely stiff wheels and you can get some that are quite compliant. Uh, so what have you got and what was it that made you pick carbon wheels if you didn't have them on the bike already, like if you upgraded to carbon? Uh, curious to know um, about that. And the same with handlebars. Now, some people are actually still terrified of running carbon bars, thinking that, oh, the carbon bars are gonna break. Well, the thing is, all bars break. Alloy bars break, carbon bars break. It could happen to anyone at any time. So, uh, forget that aside, it's not really an issue. I'm quite heavy, there's lots of heavy people, and I've got carbon bars on three bikes there. Um, and I love the feel of carbon bars because they do definitely, I'm sure of it on feel alone, reduce some of that vibration coming through to the handlebar. And that's very welcome for me. I'm not the fastest person out there. I want to be comfy on a bike. If I'm comfy, it helps me go faster. Um, yeah, and grips. Does anyone not use lock-on grips? And uh, last one, does anyone use massive volume tires, in particular on the front end, to increase your comfort at the front? Yeah, you'll get a bit more grip, but it's obviously going to be heavier, so it won't necessarily be faster. Uh, but are you doing it for comfort reasons? And finally, I guess, actually I said that was finally, but um, how do you run your suspension? Do you run your suspension on the softer side to make your bike feel real supple and grippy on the ground, or do you run it firmer so it actually feels more supple fast when you hit stuff at sort of race speed? Uh, that's how the pros tend to run the suspension. I think a lot of people, the misconception is they run their bikes very firm. They're not really that firm. It's just the fact that the bikes are set up to deal with the speeds they're riding at. Of course, you know, you, when you come to riding stuff at, what, 10, 15 miles an hour quicker than we all do, you're gonna need your suspension firmer, otherwise you're gonna be bottoming out constantly. Uh, so it's all relative, but uh, how do you run yours? Let us know in the comments underneath. Um, I wanna know what's best and what suits you. Uh, fire away. Okay, next up in news, uh, we have a new partner at GMBM. So we are riding Spank wheels now, which is great. Suits me, they make only alloy wheels. But the cool thing that I'm really interested in is the Vibracore wheels. Now we have heard of Vibracore before, We've seen it in handlebars. Again, it's something I've never ridden, but been fascinated by. Don't know why I've not tried them, to be honest. Now, Vibracore is essentially a core of a special foam that's injected in that cavity wall of the rim there to help reduce the vibration transmitted uh, through to the rider, essentially. So apparently it helps reduce that chatter that you can get, the fine chatter, uh, and vibration, of course, that transmits its way through to you, the rider. Now the wheels, yes, super nice wheels. We'll take a closer look at these another time. I'm actually about to put them on a bike and have a go on these. 102 teeth pick up on these. Really, really nice. Uh, J-type wheels, uh, micro spline. You can get them with the HD driver, of course. But let's have a little close-up look at the wheels themselves, uh, the rims even. So on screen, you should see this cross section that I'm holding my hand here. In fact, this one, this is a 359 rim construction. Now ignore the core for a second. The first cool thing about these is they have something called bead bite. Now, one of the things you get when you're pushing a bike hard into a turn, forget using inserts here, we're talking just standard setup or perhaps tubeless, 
is known as burping. And it's basically essentially where your tire breaks grip very slightly, you know, for a split second uh, between the bead, basically the bead of the tire just moves very slightly against this sort of the bead locking section on the rim here. Now note the profile on the inside of this one is ridged to give it a lot more grip. Now that is supposed to keep the bead firmly in place. So I have high hopes for that, it's a good looking system. But the core itself, this is mega cool. So to do this in the handlebars, and they've been doing this for some time, and they've done a lot of science on this, suggesting that certain frequencies of vibration, uh, if you think, look at road workers, for example, working on the jackhammers, you imagine that vibration that could be transmitted through to your hands. It'd be awful, wouldn't it? So kind of a similar thing, really. If you're riding a mountain bike down a super chattery run, I don't know, Leger bike park or somewhere like that in mid-season where it's just littered with braking bumps from riders just skidding all the time. That sort of stuff, doesn't matter how you set your bike up, it can just feel horrendous. And really that is what makes you tired. It's not the out and out riding, it's all of that vibration and punishment that comes through. So if you can reduce that, that's a great thing. So of course carbon bars is one way to go. If you prefer alloy, then the VibraCore bar could be something for you. And again, with the rims, this could be a really cool cool concept. So again, I'm not ridden these, really excited to ride them. Uh, I just wanted to talk about them because I just think it's a cool concept here to have this sort of foam core on the inside of the rim there to reduce that chatter. Now, if this is something you're not familiar with, and say, for example, one of your friends has carbon wheels and you have your alloy wheels, try their front wheel uh, on one of the sort of runs that has a bit of vibration and then you'll feel the difference because generally a tougher carbon front wheel will basically transmit more of that. So carbon, yes, as a material, carbon in the use of handlebars tends to be a bit more compliant, but in wheels, carbon tends to be used because it's a bit stiffer. Yes, they're not all the same, but most carbon mountain bike wheels tend to be very stiff, which is one of the reasons a lot of racers are picking to use alloy wheels in place of them. Uh, a little bit bendier, again, you can fix them out in the field, but it's all about reducing that uh, feedback that comes through to you that wears you down. So if you can have that in a set of wheels, I'm all in. Um, I'll update you when I've ridden them because I've not ridden them yet. Uh, something else that they include on their wheels is radial compliance. So their wheels come laced up basically, uh, as you'd expect, and <laughs> they're not gonna uh, ride a bike without laced up spokes. They come laced up with vertical compliance, bear in mind. So you might have heard some at World Cup races, in particular downhill, running very strong rims, and they're running, uh, same with Enduro, in fact, running their spokes very slightly looser. We're not talking like notably loose, just maybe quarter a turn or so backed off, and it gives a bit more compliance to that wheel, a bit more comfort. Everything we've been talking about, same thing we've been talk talking about in the topic, uh, they include that with their wheels as part of the build process, uh, which I guess would just amplify how well that that core could work. Interesting stuff, I think. And just one more thing, actually, just uh, while on the topic of spank wheels here, um, without going over the top, have a look at their website. There's a surprising amount of tech information on how they spec and build their wheels. They're really, really finicky, and I mean that in a really good way. They talk about how, uh, they talk about the spoke lacing system they use, uh, J-Bend spokes, they talk about how they actually lace them up, they talk about the tension in the spokes that they recommend on drive side and non-drive side, they talk about their uh, vertical compliance, they call it radial compliance, uh, essentially the same thing. Uh, they're really quite detailed on this, they're really picky with their setup, so I think as we get to know the wheels a bit more, I'll probably explore it a bit more, but uh, have a look, I'm gonna throw a link in the description underneath, it's well worth a read. Now, next up in news, a uh, new tyre from Bontrager. So this is it, this is a SE6 Enduro tyre. Now, technically it's a single compound, but it has got two compounds of rubber. So it's got 70A and a 50A. Uh, 70 is the base, essentially, to give it the support that it needs. Uh, and then it has the softer 50A on the top. Now, 50 is soft, but it's not the softest. So it actually is an all conditions tyre. Uh, could be a pretty good setup. Now, look at the tread design on there. I'm seeing similarities there with, I'd say, a Schwalbe Magic Mary, and perhaps a Max the Sass guy. Um, kind of has got a 2-3-2-3 two, two, three, two, three sort of alternating central pattern there. The transition between those outer shoulders and that central band looks pretty good, to be fair. Looks like a decent tire, only available in one size, 29 by 2.5. Uh, does what it says on the tin, it's an enduro race tire. So 120 TPI has armor built into the casing to help resist pinches and general cuts and nicks. Weighs 1,045 grams, or at least I claim that. Uh, that's not bad for a heavy duty tire, 29 inch by 2.5, if that's a true 2.5. Uh, their cost in the UK is 60 quid thereabouts and 75 US dollars. It looks like a decent tire to me. Now, strange because Bontrager kind of always go under my radar, but the more I looked into it, the more I realized they've actually made really good tires for a long time. 
And the last time I actually sort of really looked at tyres up close is when G was riding for them, uh, on Trek, in fact. Uh, this was in his spell before, you know, he rode Continental tyres and went off onto Trek bikes, uh, rode uh, Bontrager tyres, basically. And the tyres looked really good. I remember feeling them, thinking, God, they felt really soft, really good casing on them. Uh, so another sound set of tyres. So if you don't want to uh, buy in one of the big boy brown tyres, maybe check out Bontrager. Decent tyres, you can get me Trek shops all over the world. Last up in news, there's a few new tools from Park. Uh, of course, I'm going to talk about tools, aren't I? Uh, the first one is a super simple tool that genuinely does make my life easier. Uh, it's for injecting tyre sealant. So this is it on screen, the TSI-1 tubeless sealant injector. It's essentially a industrial syringe. Now the cool thing about this is you can remove each component from the syringe, you can properly clean it out, uh, just so like you can with some of the pro bleeding syringes. Really good piece of kit, essential for a workshop, and in my eyes, if you're running tubeless, the best way to top up and you see it is straight in through the valve, in which case you do need some kind of uh, way of injecting it. The good thing about using a syringe doing it rather than the supplied little connecting tube that you get with many tubeless sealant bottles is you inject it straight into the tire. So hopefully it doesn't actually clog up the inside of that valve stem there. Uh, definitely worth a look. Simple tool just makes your life easier. That is what good tools should do. One more thing just to um, reference to that. Park have listed a, a a selection of compatible sealants on there. They haven't gone through the entire catalogue, but sealants they know that works, uh, that won't clog on the inside of there are Continental Revo sealant, Maxima Racing Oils, never used that one. Anyone use that? If you have, let us know what it's like. Always interested to try new sealants. Uh, Muck Off, Orange Seal Endurance, Orange Seal Regular, Orange Seal Sub-Zero. Don't think I'll ever get to use that one, to be fair. Uh, PTs, uh, Slime STR, Squirt Seal, I've never used that one either, and Stan Snow Tube. So, it says original, they haven't tested it with a race formula, which uh, is, it has extremely large lumps in it. So uh, if anyone uses it with that one, it could clog, I would think, but uh, as long as you clean it out, shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but interesting stuff, all the same. Uh, next up is a bicycle cassette cleaning brush. It's essentially an industrial cleaning brush. Uh, it's got really stiff bristles on it, and they're actually profiled if you look up close here, so it actually gets around your cassette uh, chain ring, thing like that. If you ride in mucky conditions and you need to clean your bike fast and efficiently, a good set of brushes is key. Now, I'm sure a lot of you already have brushes. This is another one for the collection. And the last one is a drivetrain cleaning brush. So this one pretty much is to get in between the sprockets of a 12 and 11 speed cassettes where they're really narrow together. It can be really difficult if you get hay and grass and other stuff wrapped around. If you don't want to just be whipping a cassette off to clean it all, uh, a brush like this gets in there nicely. It's also got like a shaped plastic or nylon end on the other end, which is really good for scraping off all that gunk you get on the teeth of those guide wheels. Uh, yeah, and that's nasty stuff that is. So uh, always good to have a couple more brushes in the collection. And there we go. Right, next up, let's move into the quiz. Three questions coming at you. First question on screen now, which direction do bottom bracket cups tighten and why? Next question, what was the first threadless headset system called? And who made it as well? And the last one, name the rider and the bike in this image. Okay, so let's jump into top mods now. So we've got a selection of top mods and then there's a little one I just wanna talk about. Uh, a few of you have asked about it. So uh, first up, let's jump into the top mods. Now this is essentially one top mod. It's probably the best one I've seen in a long time. So I'm gonna have to look at the pictures in reverse because there's so many of them. And it's a fresh build for my daughter. So how cool is this? So this is all the way from Matthew in Liverpool and it's a specialized stump jumper. It says, Dolly, I purchased this small 2014 stump jumper frame to build up for my 10 year old daughter. Very, very lucky girl. Um, especially lucky that she's got a great bike, but also she's got a dad that's got her riding on a cool bike as well. When I picked up the bike, everything was full of rust, so I set about rebuilding it. I stripped the bike down to a bare frame, removed all the bearings, and I sent the frame for glass bead, bead blasting, which removes all the old paint and the imperfections. When I received the frame back, I then primed it, flat sanded it, and then set to painting it with paint and lacquer uh, with rattle cans, which I can't believe that you got this finish with rattle cans. Look at this. So I'm, I'm looking at all these shots on here. There's a list of components on here. Uh, I'm not gonna focus too much on those because you can see it's a very trick bike, including like, it's got a Hope headset, Halo wheels, uh, 160, 180 rotors, loads of cool stuff in it. But look at the finish on this thing. So here it is, 
as you stripped it down, just a boring frame, just like a dark blue, gray, black kind of, can't tell in the sun there. And then that's when it looks primed. So you've done all the nice finishing on there. Yep, looking good already, looking very smooth. Good work on that primer. I'm, I'm so impressed by this. I also like the inside of your bike cave, by the way, there. Load of cool radio control cars. Is that a Unimog on the top shelf as well? Awesome, I've never seen a radio control Unimog. That's got to be the coolest one of the lot. And here we go, here comes the paint. Look at this. Right, so there's your first layer. That is a bold purple colour. Looking very, very cool. Look at the graphics as well. I'm, I'm just astonished with how well you've done this. Really, really cool stuff. And look at that. It's almost like an iridescent finish, isn't it? That looks absolutely fantastic. She must be so stoked that you've done this for her. You haven't just got her a bike and built it up. You've actually gone to, gone to town to fully customise it. Cool purple stem as well to match. I love the way you've done the graphics. That just looks, you know what, it looks better than a lot of specialised bikes you can buy. This is just really inspirational for me to see someone's gone to this much effort. And thank you, Matthew, for sending the pictures in. Really cool to see. And there she is on her bike. And rightly so, looks really, really happy for that. Uh, awesome stuff. Now, the next one I just want to talk about, I put a picture up at the weekend. I went for a ride, basically took my son Dustin out. Uh, and I've got a Wii Ride, which is a little child seat that sits on the, basically has a fake top tube that goes on the bike. Now, a lot of people asked about how I'd set it up because it essentially has two clamps uh, with this artificial top tube that you can adjust the length. One end goes around your seat tube, uh, or around the seat post itself, obviously not on the telescopic bit if you have a dropper. And the other bit goes around your handlebar stem spacers. Okay, but the problem with that is it can cause a little bit of friction if you don't get it on quite right. And because of the, the design of mountain bikes, you can't always get it in quite the right place. Now, I've got mine mounted a little bit differently. I did reference this in my Canyon Spectral bike check a while back, but I actually have this set up. I pretty much leave it on the e-bike at the moment because it's the perfect bike. So it also means my wife can ride this bike with a little dusting on and it's easy enough for her to go up the hills with him. He's, pretty, he's a bit of a lump as well now. So I take the headset spacers off. I had, I think about 15 millimeters worth of spacers underneath the stem as standard on my Spectral On. And I replace them with two upper bearing races. So you can see them just here. Now, when you do this, it's absolutely key to make sure that you have the finest washer possible underneath, on top, um, and in the middle of them, especially in the middle, because if those bearings bind, they're not gonna do their job. Now, the theory behind this is the bearings are replacing the spacer, so you can compress the headset, or you can press the stem onto the top with, to remove the play as you would normally. They're not doing any job for the headset at this point, except acting as a dummy spacer. But when you clamp on the Wii Ride system, you clamp onto the outer surface of these bearings, your steering is not affected by it whatsoever. So I've got really smooth steering on here. Uh, having dust on the bike doesn't affect anything other than the obvious, having a bulk of a kid in the big seat there. But it's a really cool seat. Obviously, it's not going to suit all bikes. Now, I know that some people have struggled, and it will be people with smaller bikes. That's the size extra large bike. It's not the biggest. It's not as big as my analog. I hate to use that word. That's my real Spectral. The real Spectral has got a much longer reach on now, so I kind of wish that the e-bike version did but it's not a problem. If I'm sat down with the saddle up at the correct height, his helmet doesn't hit me in the chest, it's actually fine. When I'm stood up, it's fine. Uh, the only time it would, he would hit me is if I have the saddle any lower. So it can be a bit of an issue for my wife's time, so it might be an issue for some of you. I've got to seat as far forwards as possible, but for what you're really gonna do on, on a sort of a bike with a wee ride on it, and it ride to the shops, ride to down the canal, that sort of stuff, is absolutely fine. But definitely, if you're running a system like this, consider the, the bearing hack there. You can get a couple of bearings pretty cheap from any sort of bearing shop, it doesn't really matter what they are, as long as the internal diameter is the same size as your, um, as your steerer tube, essentially, so they don't rattle around. And it works great, and there you go. A little top mod from me. Oh, and we've got some rewind time as well. So if you've got anything old school, send it in. There's a link at the bottom of the screen. There's another one in the description underneath. Uh, I'm gonna hit you straight up with this awesome picture of a Santa Cruz, which for a minute, I thought this picture uh, came from the States somewhere, but actually it's uh, taken Portland in Dorset uh, on probably the only nice day weather we've had. What a great looking bike, man. Seriously cool, isn't it? So that looks like a kind of a beige finish. The classic Santa Cruz single pivot bike. Uh, it wasn't the first, the first was the Tasman, which actually I preferred. Uh, although it wasn't as good, it was clunkier, it was heavier. Um, probably didn't work quite as well, but the Tasman 
for the fact it was the original, it was the OG, it was a little bit cooler, but the Heckler was the one that everyone wanted. Super high demand bike. In fact, Team MB UK used to race that as a downhill bike, which just proved the versatility of it. I think it had four inches of travel, 100 mil travel on the rear or thereabouts, and it looks like you've got a Judy DH fork on the front. You've got the Shimano DX uh, cantilever, well, V-brakes, and the DX SPDs as well. So I'm guessing you had a bit of fun on this bike. WTB Velociraptors. Do you know, that tire was actually surprisingly good. They're quite tall, they're a little bit thinner for their size, but uh, really grippy, good rubber on those from what I remember. Looks awesome, mate. So 1998 Santa Cruz Heckler. Yeah, great looking bike, that. Right, next up is a Klein Pinnacle from the early 90s. So the Pinnacle was a super light cross-country frame. But on this one, this one's specced out a little bit differently. As you can see, we're set up on big bars and a big comfy saddle. A bit more like a beach cruiser. So this is from Robert. It doesn't say where he is. And he says, just completed uh, this rebuild of my early 90s flare red Klein. It's been sitting around. It had the mission control bar on stem, so, so I took that off and decided to make it into something uh, my partner could use. Opted to remove the MC1 handlebar, gave it a new stem and a chrome swept back bar. Kept the rest of the bike pretty much intact. Um, although I do like the fact you've got a Judy DH on there. So that, that had 75 mil travel when it came out, which, you know, that was a downhill fork. In fact, I remember some of the reviews saying, oh, this thing's bonkers, you can ride it in the kerbs, which is laughable by today's standards because you could do that on any, any suspension fork. But uh, when they came out, you just couldn't do that on mountain bikes. Hell of a fork. Uh, changed the bike cable housing to match the logo colour. Yeah, nice touch. Replaced the old WCB saddle with a wide leather springer seat and the transformation was complete. A nice blend between a mountain bike and a beach cruiser. Uh, do you know what? That second shot, the indoor one, it looks really cool there. Good lighting. Good selection of vinyl as well in the background there. I'm a bit of a vinyl man as well. Nice stuff. Really cool to see Robert. And great to see an old bike being used and just not abandoned. Uh, nothing wrong with not riding old bikes, but if, uh, if they're just going to waste, you may as well use them. Okay, next up is from Connor in Ipswich. Check this out, 2002 Rocky Mountain RM7 free ride. Oh man, that was a cool bike. In fact, I, I watched earlier on Ride the Lightning, the New World Disorder film. I think that's the fourth one, I'm gonna say off the top of my head, and it has uh, Richie Schley doing his old Schleyville tops, Wade Simmons, in fact, he had the RM9, where he does that massive road gap. Uh, that was in, the, that wasn't Ride the Lightning, Free Wheel Burning, that was in the third one. In fact, I watched both of them back to back, actually. I uh, just found those online. Really cool to see that classic thrust link design, almost like a single pivot with the linkage to drive the shot, like a motocross bike, essentially. Shivers on the front, man, look, just look at the thing. Uh, Titec bars, by any chance, were they Easterns? Forget what people used to run back then. Can't quite see, but there you are, ripping on the bike. You got your Protec lid, the S and M on there. Nice. So uh, I guess you ride a bit of 20 inch as well. Man, it's a cool looking bike. It looks pretty burly there, doesn't it? Kind of forget. What do they weigh? 45 pounds, something like that maybe. Wicked to see it still being used. Uh, I hear that they used to break back in the day, but um, I don't know how. Look at look how much metal's on them. Made of girders, those things. Super active design from what I remember as well. Awesome to see it still being ridden. Looks like it's been loved. Oh, we've got another one. Oh wow, I didn't realize how many we've got this week. So this one is a Voodoo, uh, and it's a Voodoo D-Jab Titanium from 1997. I bought this frame in 2019 to train myself to build bikes in my tiny flat. Uh, designed by the legend Joe Murray. Yeah, of course, Joe Murray that used to race for Gary Fisher. Uh, then he went on to design Kona bikes and Voodoo bikes. Uh, he's a Shimano Skunk Works development rider. Uh, Ultra talented rider, super cool guy, really knows his stuff as well. Uh, and look at the frame, lovely looking bit of kit that. You've also got a Terralogic Fox fork on there as well. Uh, so it had some sort of inertia valve on the inside there to stop it moving uh, to bumps. Uh, so stop it moving to rider movement, but opened up to bumps even. Has anyone ridden a titanium bike out there? If you haven't and you get the chance, demo a titanium hardtail bike, even if you don't think hardtails are the way to go, you'll be really surprised by the ride of them. Titanium bikes have got such a unique ride. So in hardtail speak, you'd have an alloy bike that has generally a very stiff, responsive, could be harsh ride to them. You'd have steel that has a slightly more flexible, compliant feel, uh, but definitely some steel frames can feel a bit dead. Lighter ones using stuff like Reynolds 853 can feel a bit springier. And then you've got titanium, which is kind of the better side of steel, but with a side of compliance and springiness you just can't get on other bikes. 
titanium frames are a work of art. Uh, and if I was going to have another titanium uh, another hardtail frame, it would be a titanium frame for sure. Uh, the cool thing is that titanium doesn't corrode, so you don't need to put paint on it or anything. You can just run it as it is and just look at the real beauty of that frame. And I've got to say, your one does look super nice. Mega stuff. Super good to see. So uh, some great stuff in there uh, from Rewind this week. <laughs> Okay, so quiz answer time. Right, so first one coming up on the screen, which direction the bottom bracket cups tighten and why? So they both tighten to the rear of the bike, which might seem a bit counterintuitive. So that means that your left hand cup, um, sorry, the non drive side cup, that tightens clockwise and it's the opposite, is counterclockwise for the drive side cup there. So they both go to the back of the bike. Um, and you might be wondering why, because that would feel like they could come loose, right, as you're pedaling? Well, here's why. So the first school of thought is the fact that if your bearings seize up in there, and if, it, and if they were to screw in towards the front of the bike, you'd actually tighten the cups into the frame so much that you might never be able to get them out. You might damage them trying to get them out. So if your bearings did seize up, the original school of thought was your cups could loosen slightly. So uh, better, than, better to loosen than to damage the frame by screwing them in too hard. And then the second school of thought here is, think what a cartridge bearing does. You've got an inner race and you've got an outer race. You've got an inner surface and outer surface. They move in different directions. So yes, the bearing moves this way, but the inside actually helps keep the cup in place. So pretty cool stuff there. And of course, it's the opposite way around with the pedals. They tighten to the front of the bike for the very same reason uh, with the way that you pedal. Have a little think about that. It's pretty cool stuff. Uh, next up, what was the first threadless headset system called and, and who made it? It was called the A headset, and that was made by Diacomp or Cane Creek as we now know them. Uh, they were a company from Cane Creek Drive that actually used to manufacture the first RockShox stuff as well, so pretty cool stuff. Uh, we, of course, universally we just call them headsets now, but they technically are A headset by design. And the last one, name the rider and the bike in this image. It's Jesse Melamed and it's his Rocky Mountain. Yeah, super nice guy, super nice bike. Uh, I've done a bike check with him. That's gonna be popping up on the GMBN Tech channel soon. Uh, some really cool stuff on his bike. In fact, his cockpit set up on there. Um, I'm gonna throw one more photo in actually. The cockpit set up on his bike reminded me a bit more of a Moto Enduro bike. Uh, the stuff he's got going on, his display, his guards, everything all compact in, just looks mega, mega interesting and some really cool detail in that bike check as well. So keep an eye out for that on GMB and Tech. Uh, there we go, that's the end of this week's show. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed the ride. Uh, I've got to say I struggled this week with a flipping A fever. Um, hopefully you're not suffering from that and you're able to get out and enjoy the hills. I'm gonna try and get out for a ride shortly. See you in the next show, ta -ra.